welcome and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Bala Afshar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, and our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV and we'll do our best to answer them. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He's the CEO founder of Constellation Research, best-selling author of book titled Disrupting Digital Business, regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, uh, MIT Sloan Review, ZDNet, and other major publications. And in my humble opinion, one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray Wang, to Disrupt TV. Hey, last lot with okay, my co-host, Bala Afshar. He's the chief digital evangelist at Salesforce, but more importantly, one of the top followers on CMOs and CIOs for Twitter. People follow his advice all around the world. He just came back from Australia. He's a, truly a star. And, uh, well, it's not about us. So let's talk about what's happening next. Who do we got on our show? It's our privilege to start the show with Guy Marion, CEO and co-founder of Brightback, the first automated customer retention software for subscription businesses bringing unique SaaS growth product and sales experience from launch to 100 million ARR to IPO. Prior to founding uh, Brightback, Guy was an entrepreneur in residence at Matrix Partners. He was chief operating officer at Autopilot, head of online sales at Zendex, VP and GM at Collabnet, and CEO of CodeSign acquired by Collabnet in 2010. You can follow Guy on Twitter at Guy underscore Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N. Welcome Guy to Disrupt TV. Thank you, Vilar. Great to be here today. Thank you. And thanks, Ray, too. <laughs> hey, no problem. Look, it's not like you're a newbie to the SaaS industry or to cloud computing or to startups. Um, so let's ask you, what's, what is this big problem, right? Everyone's got to worry about, you know, their MAUs, their DAUs, their ARPUs, their customer lifetime value. So why are SaaS companies suddenly focusing again and, and dealing with these issues around customer retention? Yeah, great question. Um, the industry is now well and truly moved towards subscription business model. That's nothing new anymore. Um, I think we're seeing the version two and version three companies now disrupting their incumbents, which are SaaS one companies or SaaS two companies. Um, we've been through a prolific phase from a, a growth from both a funding cycle perspective and from a growth of the industry perspective. If you look at the, the MarTech 5000 landscape, for example, 10 years ago, I think there was you know, a couple hundred applications and there's 6,000 today. So we've seen basically companies grow prolifically. Um, we've seen uh, that the customer is now truly in control. As easily as you can sign up, you can leave a service. Mm -hmm. And every space is teeming with high-performing uh, vendors uh, to, to serve a finite pool of customers. And so um, what we're recognizing now is that while for the last 10 years, the industry has been driven by acquisition growth at all costs, we're now in a space and a time where CROs are thinking actively about retention and acquisition together. Like they have to have to do organic growth? Wait, wait what do you mean? <laughs> so, they actually have to do real work and retain customers? <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, Just right. right. Speaking of, speaking of real work and, and, um, and a shift in mindset where you, you have to recognize that the marriage experience needs to be better than the courtship experience. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, retention is more important uh, or as important as acquisition. Do you think the shift in mindset in terms of um, appreciating and maintaining uh, customer loyalty will have impact on how we measure sales success uh, and, and the KPIs we use to identify high performing sales where now the shift is how well you increase adoption and, and, and keep a customer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're already seeing that today. You know, I think that the, the movement of the funnel, you've been seeing HubSpot putting out a lot of content around the funnel is dead. We're now in the flywheel business cycle. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing that marketers are lining around LTV and the ideal customer profile as much as they are around initial lead conversion today. Um, so, and on the sales side, um, a lot of companies are, are repositioning their and reorganizing their sales orders to uh, take ownership of books of business, not just close new business. Um, so we're really seeing that both on the B2B side and from a B2C perspective for online acquisition. Um, so yes, I think we're actively seeing those KPIs the, at the company level, ARR followed by net retention is something that is the mm -hmm. top of every investor's mind when they look at a new SaaS company today. That's great advice. 
Yeah, you know, but, but there's that piece, right? There's the retention aspect. And then people are trying to figure out, are customers happy? Right. right. So yeah, they're using the software. They're kind of engaging. Like, how do you track happiness? Can you quantify that? I mean, that's, a, that's such a qualitative measure. Absolutely. I mean, so obviously the industry has been using services like NPS services and measuring their customer's activation rate as a measure of usage. Hmm. But also you can look at customers at key points in their life cycle, survey them, ask them, uh, why you're leaving a service, for example, or why you're upgrading right now and what's your likelihood to return as well as use gauges of sentiment. The key mm. is to do this systematically and keep monitoring, not just at, uh, at random points, but it's at key transition points. We look, for example, at the point of cancel and we measure happiness essentially through likelihood to return and sentiment as well as qualitative feedback that customers provide. And by measuring that at the same point, and then adjusting business over time, we're helping our customers. Um, and you, it's very possible to grow the happiness of, of customers by identifying friction points and eliminating them systematically. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, when I think of net promoter score, um, to me, it's a, it's a question based on intent for advocacy. The question is, would you recommend uh, to a friend, colleague based on product or service quality? And given the social listening tools and, and advanced AI powered uh, applications that exist today, it should be a shift to a, a, a more appropriate, maybe a social promoter score that says, have you recommended to whom and did it result in incremental revenue? And, and you don't necessarily have to rely on survey. You can just analyze your, your customer database and, and, and your prospects to measure sentiment, all the activities on social channels, and be able to come up with a sentiment tone happiness score based on what's being said. Do you find companies that are mature in terms of the digital transformation journey shifting from intent for advocacy to searching for actual advocacy and, and, and business outcomes? Yes, I think that the NPS score has seen a great day, but I think you're, you're, you're spot on that um, understanding sentiment from across the social ecosystem as well as from multiple lines of how to view customers. If you think about it, we've had customers we spend a lot of time scraping and developing gauges for leads in the sales world. And yet by the time you've been with a customer for three years, you have a, a much greater richness of data about that customer. You can see their online behavior, their billing purchasing history, their level of engagement with your service, the level of engagement with your team members, uh, you know, with ticketing and through support. Um, and really it's layering on these each additional uh, source of insight about users, you can build a much more rich view around actual customer happiness to your point there. In terms of leading edge and people doing it, I think it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to do this, but I think there's services starting to make it more possible. And a lot of companies are experimenting now with these multifactorial gauges of uh, customer happiness. Totally. But, but Guy, you've, you've got the most interesting requests. Like I've, I've seen a couple of our, well, I'd say a half of our clients, you've told them, look, you should automate your cancel experience, right? <laughs> and, and they're like, what? What the heck are you talking about? Are we gonna make it easier for people to cancel? Um, and your point is, well, let's make it easy for them to cancel to figure out how to retain them. And I'm like, that, it's like so counterintuitive. And then when you look at it, it works. Talk a little bit about that because it, it, it boggles the mind of, of some of our prospects. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Uh, it is counterintuitive. Um, I would argue that retention is a new acquisition when you think about the perspective of it, that retaining a customer is easier and frankly lower risk than trying to acquire a new one and certainly 7x cheaper. Um, the, the counterintuitive approach comes from the fact that if you look at when people cancel, they do it throughout the life cycle. They might do it within three minutes of signing up for a service within three hours or three years later. So the context under which they're leaving, the reason why, did they figure out how to use it? Did they misperceive the product? Did they have a negative experience with the support member? Did they uh, fail to recognize the value? Each of those provide critical contacts that if you can identify those, certain of those are influenceable and we can solve that problem and retain sort of 10 to 20% of customers at the point of cancel and learn from the rest. It's a forgotten uh, micro moment in the customer journey. Now, do you have like best practices? Is, is it kind of like, oh, I saw content I didn't like, or it was a really bad pricing thing, or it was an in incident request or service request that never got fulfilled, um, or I don't know, some macro event happened, right? And, you know, the CEO of the company is like on the cover of like, you know, most wanted men and women of America. <laughs> I mean, are you down to that level? 
We uh, actually, yes, we, we do get down to that level. The way that we, we work is we have I don't think practice. exaggerating, but you know. <laughs> I mean, not quite to that level, but you know, we do offer best practices around um, different types of offers. So engaging customers, solving their problems, onboarding them for them, making discount offers, providing feedback requests, engaging from executives. And the idea is that you personalize the experience for each end user based on information we know about them. Are they paying monthly or annual or what plan are they on or how active are they or how old are they? And you overlay these dimensions and then you serve up these personalized experiences that are designed to meet their problems. And so at that point, the copy and the offers definitely um, are important. And what we do of course is test all of this and figure out what the best responses are to the appropriate segment. And we learn across, uh, across many customers. Yeah, that makes that makes and personalization and speed. I think are cr critical currencies in this hyper-connected knowledge-sharing economy, where people have more choices. And you're right; it could be three minutes, three days, three years. If you lose their trust at any point during that journey, they can just flip the switch and move to someone else. So, so given given the fact that uh, you know you're trying to glean as much contextual intelligence from your customers. Um, so that you can build your anticipatory muscle. I'm assuming that people that use your services are able to anticipate outcomes so that in the future you can prevent as many cancellation scenarios. And I, I thought when I looked at your um, findings, you, you're, you're converting 40%. So your system allows almost one in two to, after they in, initiate the cancellation, actually convert and, and change their mind and stay with the customer, which I thought was amazing. So. Where's that balance of digital engagement and human touch? How do you, how do you combine those two methods of re-engaging in order to continue to earn the future business of your customers? Yeah, so what we do is we connect with the most popular systems of record like Salesforce, as well as with systems of engagement. So Slack, Segment, Zendesk, Zapier, and services like that. And in doing so, we're able to actually be a system of intelligence that brings together information about the customers with the right engagement channels to, to engage them on. And then we are able to start to test out different types of engagement. So really what we're doing is using technology to serve out up a try to touch sort of a model. So we essentially provide qualified engagements or mm -hmm. Um, opportunity window we create windows of opportunity to either digitally or from a human perspective engage with customers for the right reason at the right time cool very cool now can I ask you so in the b2b space my experience tells me that the average buying decision team in the b2b could be as much as eight to ten people and I have found based on my experience in order to, in order to try to influence it's, it's hard to try to influence eight or ten different personas with different buying process maps what you really should try to identify is the most influential person in the buying decision team, feed her the information you need to have her influence the peers and the rest of the folks in the buying decision team. Does the intelligence that you glean help identify the top influencer within an organization and then you create an engagement model that allows her to help regain trust and confidence uh, with the customer? Um, we certainly provide and so Speaking to your point, yes, completely agreed. If you're, if you're serving large multi-stakeholder organizations, identifying the, the key stakeholders, obviously what customer success teams are actively looking towards at all times, right back works typically with or alongside a customer success platform um, where the team is using that, where right back is typically engaging and where there's a real big problem in the industry is what happens with the long tail base, whether those are consumers of a digital streaming service or whether those are small businesses where there isn't that level of visibility or decision making, but there is a need for high volume retention and engagement. And yeah. so in those segments, then it's, you know, typically the person canceling is the decision maker and it's more engaging at that level. Got it. Got it. Yeah, this is so interesting, this turn thing and deflection, right? I mean, I want to go back to a point you talked about earlier, right? I mean, it's, it's so much easier retaining a customer than trying to, you know, acquire a new customer that people are willing to split that difference on arbitrage and, and figure out how to do deflection. So what are people getting for deflection rates? I mean, are we talking like 40%, 60%, 20%? Like, I mean, I mean I, I'm sure it depends on industry and, and, and the company that we're working with, right? Or, or how many choices are in the market, but, but what, what are typical rates? 
Yeah, so we, we see um, rates around, um, around 5 to 25%, depending on company, depending on industry. Um, hmm. You know, for companies that are churning a thousand or more accounts per month, these numbers are extremely material, particularly if it's automated and systematic for them mm. while focusing and engaging with top customers. Um, and so, so there's also a funnel view where you identify potential customers who are likely to leave and then automate approaches to engage those. And then we, we calculate save rates uh, at a period downstream, 30 days after a customer is first identified. And that's what we consider a save. So. We're, you know, we're still, we're still uh, benchmarking that actively with our customers, but that's something that we do is we, we compare across business models, consumer and B2B. And, um, and then what we see is the save rates vary dramatically, not just by company, but then by reason as well. So some of the most commonly saved reasons are people who never onboarded to begin with, or actually a negative customer interaction and experience, or um, don't believe the product they're using could actually solve their problem because they misunderstand it or pricing and value uh, misalignment at various key points in the life cycle. Those are all easily, uh, not easily, but higher likelihood to, uh, to retain uh, reasons for canceling. So, so it, it, it's, I, I don't know if you, you mentioned them in order, but you mentioned value, you mentioned quality, and you mentioned um, maybe lack of experience or education in terms of how to fully optimize and utilize the service. Can you put them in order? Is, is there, what, what are the top two or three reasons why based on yep. your experience, people leave. Yeah, so number one reason is they never onboarded or figured it out to begin with, really? which isn't exactly rocket science, wow. but, um, but it's actually exactly what the benchmark data supports uh, mm -hmm. that we see with our customers, which are mostly consumerized B2B. Um, companies invest millions of dollars onboarding new customers, and yet um, it's always an area to improve on. So one mm -hmm. thing is to measure customers leaving for that reason, understanding the qualitative insights as well as the quantitative insights, and then combining follow-up flows or engagements when they're at risk that reinforce the onboarding efforts is a tremendous way we've seen customers be able to really generate um, substantial wins from their already investments they're making in their customer's journey. Sure. That's, uh, wow. such a fixable thing. <laughs> like, it is. <laughs> One would think. The, One would think. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and to be clear, the best companies do this. I mean, I've been in companies in the past where there's a lot of investment internally, but the, the, the approach in the industry so far has been growth teams and teams within their organization kind of building it and figuring it out. And what we're really doing is bringing some of those best practices out, standardizing them, quantifying them, and then making it possible for, the, for everybody to do that. That's great. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little shop here. I mean, Index Ventures came in with uh, what 0.9 Matrix Rembrandt. Um, these are some big names uh, backing you on this. Uh, talk about the process raising money today because it's been brutal from from what I've heard from everyone else. So, and, and brutal in the sense that you know everybody's coming in as, as a feature. Everybody thinks that you know they're they're going to narrow it down to three competitors if there's like 30 out there. Uh, and so just to make it to get funded uh, is, is, is the tough part. So, Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I mean, for my background, I've been raising funding. I raised funding 10 years ago for my first company and found it to be absolutely brutal. I've subsequently been in industry in Zendesk and autopilot growing businesses along the way um, through those experiences was able to um, gain exposure to and work alongside some of the VCs, which is definitely beneficial. During the EIR, I prototyped this product pretty heavily and demoed it to a lot of people, um, industry experts, gathered their feedback and insights and was able to leverage that. At a certain point, my prototype feedback sessions turned from, you should try this, have you thought about this, to how do I buy that? And that was when we knew there was a real action here. And then, um, and then being an EIR and a firm obviously helped. And then from there, what I did is I actually went back to the same people who gave me insights and said, would you like to invest now? and pretty quickly built out a seed round of a lot of you know, heads of growth and success in Silicon Valley companies, which then transitioned more into some of the VCs joining a seed round. So the seed round closed out with a lot of people that now I speak to on a regular basis. They gather more insight, both on the product and the problem in the space. And then um, the Series A came after that with the seed investor being the, the, one of my seed investors led the Series A as well. That's awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to get you all um, at some point, I'm going to connect you with your, we have our ambient experience summit in Atlanta at the Porsche Speedway. 
And it's really talking about everything from customer success, retention, um, new experiences, brand design. Uh, it's going to happen uh, February 26 to 28. So we'll talk awesome. a little bit more afterwards. It's something awesome. hot that's happening. And I think it, you'd be a great addition to it once we figure out the final agenda. So, hey, thanks a lot for being on the show. This is amazing. We're talking to startups and founders uh, today in the CX space. And uh, our first guest, Guy Marion, CEO and co-founder at Brightback. Definitely a serial entrepreneur uh, and working at some of the most interesting startups and SaaS companies. You can follow him on Twitter at Guy underscore Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Thank you, Guy. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Val. A lot of fun and uh, love the show. Thank you, sir. You're a terrific. <laughs> You know, it's so important in SaaS companies to understand retention. It's it's yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's incredibly frustrating to lose customers, especially if it's lack of education and adoption. Things that, frankly, again, the marriage experience has to be better than the courtship experience. Yeah. <laughs> up on our conversation, we now have uh, joining us uh, Manny Medina, CEO of Outreach, the leading sales engagement platform. Outreach is pioneering a brand new category, the customer engagement platform. So. If you want to keep your customers, you better stay engaged. Before founding Outreach, Manny was employee number three at Amazon AWS team and later moved to Microsoft to lead their mobile division, taking them from launch to 50 million in annual revenue. You can follow Manny on Twitter at N-E-D-I-N-I-S-M. Welcome, Manny, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, uh, I, was, I was following the last conversation. It was pretty entertaining. You guys are pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> Hey, we'll try to. It's Friday. Right? All it's the Friday. fun. It's all in. Yeah. So, I wonder you got, you got right, some so. booze or under the table. What else keeps you going? Because it's, it's just a lot of back and forth. No, no, no. Just, 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 just the Samsung Galaxy Note 10, right? It's just uh, <laughs> getting unpacked, trying to figure out what's going on. So we'll see what's going on. Hey, so this is great, right? I mean, this is we've been talking to startup founders, CEOs. Um, this is part of the ethos of our show. Um, what we're really doing here is really we were trying to understand, right, this whole area. Why is there so much VC interest in this space? And, and I, I couch it like this, like we went from broad categories to specific products to we're down to like feature sets all getting the same valuation um, because there's something missing in the marketplace. And some of these features are becoming big categories onto themselves. So, so what's driving this VC interest in your space? Um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the, the general theme is that is that we introduced we introduced a new category that is it's it's called the sales engagement category. But if you were to think about broadly, it's about systems of action. So I think what VCs are saying is that look, the '90s was all about systems of record and moving those workloads to the cloud, right? So Salesforce and and that ilk came along in those days, and they made a mint of taking large repositories of data and putting them on the cloud. And that was hugely disruptive because it, it literally introduced the cloud to the rest of us. So it was the heart of digital transformation. Now, when I tell you digital transformation, most people you know, who are in tech roll their eyes. I'm like, yeah, that was 10 years ago because we're moving past that. And, that was and, 10 years ago, actually. <laughs> right. Like, built the whole now, company on it 10 years now, ago. Now everybody's like, oh, so what's next? And what's next is that you need to start separating the system or record where you store your data from the system of action where the rep or the or the person lives. And once you do that, a lot of the sort of like the canvas just opens up, right? Because now there's a lot more things that you can do because the action itself has a lot more nuance to it, has a lot more data to it, has a lot more contingencies with other people, right? So action means that I'm talking to you. So Zoom is a system of action for video and they belong into that category where they can capture a lot of things, conversations and videos, they're, there, there's not a, a big leap to say that eventually they're going to start understanding your facial expressions to, to give you emotion, to give you a rating, and to help you coach you through a conversation. So all those things now become available to you once you separate the layers. Same thing with Slack. Same thing with Zendesk. Same thing with Outreach. Outreach sits in the middle in the, of the engagement, sits in the middle of a, of a prospect, rep, prospect uh, rep and customer conversation and helps the rep navigate through that conversation. Nothing is preventing us from helping the buyer go through that conversation. Nothing is preventing us from continuing to read emotions and to sort of figure out what works and what doesn't work, from bringing other channels of communication into the same engagement layer and give you the same amount of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the canvas is just really, really large. And if you look at Salesforce at a $100 billion valuation and knowing that they're only 25% of the market, that gets really interesting really quick. 
because you know that even, you know, you know, in VC, right? Like even if you're in a huge market and you're a little bit off center, you still make a big outcome. And that's what I think is driving all this attention. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so we did uh, research speaking to thousands of um, sales professionals and these were folks, budget owning sales professionals, um, VPs and uh, chief revenue officers and found that well, only 34% of the time, the, the sales teams are actually selling, engaged with a customer. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that crazy? Just think about that for a minute. Like, a, a, rep, a rep is a huge source of burn. And what? only 34% of the time, they're productive. Just think what? about that for a minute. Like, that doesn't happen anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. imagine, imagine if your service professional was only engaged 34%. I know. I know. You think about that. Imagine <laughs> going home telling your wife, I was only productive 34% of my day. She's like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, stay here. Seventy you know, percent stay home, wash some dishes. <laughs> so, 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 so your your, your out, outreach amplify system uses machine learning to scientifically measure, test, and optimize the performance of sales teams, while automating automating their non-selling tasks on their behalf. So, my question to you is: You're using machine learning, advanced AI capabilities. Give us insight into what sales looks like maybe three to five years from now, knowing the two thirds of the time right now, sales pros are not selling. Yeah, so um, when, I, when I get this question, uh, I, I usually imply that there is a, a search for flying car stories, right? Like <laughs> I'm gonna make your car <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm here to, sorry, to burst your bubble and tell you we're not, this is not like, just like Tesla doesn't drive itself yet, we're not gonna be flying cars yet. Sure. We are at a point, but this is where we are. We are at a point in which we are finally having enough compute to be able to real time understand what's happening in the conversation. Hmm. Now, we're still lacking the rest of the context. Most people are approaching the problem from looking at the opportunity and trying to recompose what happened that got in there. We're taking the opposite approach and we're looking at the communication and we're trying to compose what, hap what goes into the opportunity. So the first few instances of things that you're going to see is very literally making the rep better. Very literally making the rep more efficient. Very literally reading sentiment to try to figure out what works and what doesn't work and steering away from what doesn't work. So half the battle is to keep the rep away from making mistakes. Yeah. When I say mistakes is saying things at the wrong time, is spending a lot of time emailing people who don't respond to email or calling people who don't respond to calls. Um, yep. Taking yep. the, the right channel, making sure that they're nailing the value proposition in less tries. So we're just trying to sort of asymptotically um, sort of uh, 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 narrow the range by which they could make a mistake. So there are more time being more effective. And that has a multiplying effect that delivers ROI in a real way because if you're doing more activity and more activity in the little and the, the more activity you're doing has is more effective, yeah. I, 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 got a, I got an amplification effect of factor of 2x on the reps production. Sure. That, uh, delivering that alone will blow everybody's mind. So let's yeah. do that for 400,000 accounts yeah. and then we can get to flying car stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> ask, to me, flying car uh, capability is, you know, it, again, I'll, I'll narrow, to, uh, on the B2B side, if an average opportunity has uh, 14, 15, 16, meaningful touch points before you close win that opportunity. How do you look at the marketing signals and correlate that to the buying decision team activity in order to recommend the right content at the right time on the right channel to the right persona to a sales professional? Do that and to me that's flying car. It, it is, but, but the problem is that the, 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 the data right now is so sparse. Yeah. And all you're doing is, 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 is sort of like, um, you know, playing correlation games. You're not playing causation games. And, and that's just, that's, I love people who do that. I'm, I'm sure there is gold in them Tar Heels. Um, <laughs> I just don't think that that's a, a very productive outcome. I'd rather play in what, in, in, the, in the actual communication flow. Like once I have you engaged, what's happening in this conversation? Now, that was, is definitely enriched 
by what else is the buyer doing? Are you going to G2 Crowd? Are you going to Captera? Are you coming in inbound? Are you going through a chat channel? Are you downloading a white paper? In the middle of our conversation, that is becomes more interesting because all of a sudden I see more signals to it. But I would be very um, skeptical of anybody that, has, that associates causation to any of the signals. They're all interesting and they're all spurious. Every person is different and buying a long time ago it stopped being a single person game and it became a team game. Right. So as a, as, a, there you, you, as a seller, you have two challenges. You have to navigate the org and then you have to have your buyer navigate his own org. Like to, to give you an example, um, we're literally, we're, we're new in Snowflake, we're expanding Snowflake, right? We, we're a Snowflake shop, we're expanding our deployments of Snowflake. My, my head of BI, she doesn't know how to expand Snowflake because she doesn't buy that many tools outside of Tableau and, and whatever. And, and so this is news for her, right? So every time buyers are not professional buyers, there's no such thing as a professional buyer. That's called procurement and that's the last person you wanna meet. So you <laughs> there's professional sellers and there's a person with a problem. You see yeah. what I mean? And yeah. that's the dichotomy that you're dealing with at all times. So like whatever you do to cross that, that, that gap is yeah. useful. So in your uh, uh, near real time, in process contextual intelligence, that enhances the engagement. Exactly, and then and then as, as you see more of that happening, yep. the system it starts to learn, right? Mm -hmm. It starts to keeping you away from words that you don't want to say. Yep. It starts to keeping you away from channels you don't want to use. So yep. you will get better by screwing up less. You see what I mean? <laughs> kind of like a sport. You develop a muscle memory about the stuff that works so you yep. don't do the shit that doesn't work all that often. You see what I mean? Let's take let's 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 take this out. Let's take this out a, a little bit more, right? So so let's go back to the thing. Like you, you're going after, let's say you're you're going after the global two thousand, right? Yeah. And you got five hundred prospects you're really going after. And typically, let's say it's five. It's five influencers and decision makers. Let's not go to eight for something like this. But let's say it's five that we know. Why can't people just figure out who these people are? Right, I mean, in, in true account-based strategy, like why are people so lazy that they don't even know who they're selling to? This part just drives me nuts, right? So you're seeing this in these account-based plans, people with these plans out, but they have no idea who they are. They have a role. They don't yeah. even know the name of the person. That person exists. Like, how can you not know this? Like, wh if you're watching they, like high-performance teams, like why are they so lazy? There is a, I think lazy is a, is a, is a strong word. I think yeah. it's, <laughs> This is truly complicated. This is why salespeople make more than CEOs. Because right. It's a truly complicated yep. problem. And it's a truly complicated problem, again, because buyers, your, your, your buyer doesn't know he's a buyer. You see what I mean? It's like the, the, the best assassin is the one that doesn't know who's, who's doing the killing. It's like that's, that's, those, are the best, those are the best sales <laughs> because you have a, a, an inside view into, into your, um, into, in, in, if you discover that path, that path is unique to you. So this is usually the problem. And let's stick with my example of like my person buying more snowflake. Um, she has a need um, and that's where it ends. Now she, that person won't be making that decision by herself because there is a night there. We, we have a, a, a customer. Uh, we have a, a chief security officer that needs to be involved. We have a whole IT organization that needs to sign off. There yep. is a whole infrastructure team that needs to live with that problem of putting that into a, into a, into a NATO US yep, system. Yep. Um, so that decision, that quote unquote decision maker has a trio of dependencies that she may not know are there. And, 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 and uh, the, the, the interesting thing is that the discovery process is a two way process, meaning you as a seller are discovering the pain, but then you are working with your champion to discover the buying process for that particular organization. And each of those each of those are each new buy is a path dependent and the more and the more expensive your solution is like let's say that you are like a half a million dollar like you know per per you know acv kind of shop dude, you're going to have a team buying this your thing right and there's going to be there's going to be blockers and champions and and doubters and and whatever coming out of the woodwork and your job is just to get out the finish line you know on you know with, without a, a whole lot of hits and with a lot of discounts your job is to get to procurement with the least amount of discount you can so that when you get to the final boss, you are able to navigate that conversation, you know, with, 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 with alacrity and, and pinage. Yeah. So yeah. The, the sales process, the, the reason why the human, so the, to your original question, like what does he, what's going to happen to the human in the sales process? We're not going anywhere. 
because organizations are just you know human edifices of 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 of, of people and feelings and intents and hitting agendas, etc. And and you as a seller need to navigate that, and you have to do it again over and over every time you buy something, you sell something. Well, what I'm saying is like it's 2050. You know, and, and, and no humans are buying anymore. They're just procurement chat bots chat that are being selling. <laughs> chatbot, chatbot selling. And personas yeah. are buying against each other. No, I, I know we're not there. But, no, but no. I, I understand the point. I was being provocative in order to, to bring out the whole process of why but, selling but, is kind of so complicated I, and why it's really important to have a platform. Yeah. And especially so when you're selling platform. innovation, when you're selling, most of so the best company, like the best sell shops in my mind are the ones that are selling you a problem you don't know you have That's and, right. and are going public doing that. Like those are, I have, I have a, there's a very special place in my heart for those shops because they have developed the art, I mean, it's totally an art of manufacturing a problem that exists in your head and you can verbalize it. And those are, those are incredible to watch. It's like magic to me. <laughs> it's up there with making a regulatory requirement too. Afterwards. Right, 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 right. right, right. <laughs> in there, boom. <laughs> Innovative companies, uh, you know, uh, you know, answer the question that their customers should be asking. So, so I totally agree with what you said. I also, I, you know, a river without boundaries is a puddle. So I believe that what you're doing, especially using technologies like machine learning to create that engagement, constant flow with minimal amount of friction, because you're adding context and, and you're helping companies graduate from descriptive use of analytics to diagnostic, to predictive, to prescriptive. Right. prescribing what the seller should do in order to keep that optimal engagement. So talk to me, talk to us about your views in terms of AI and yeah. whether this is something that's going to help companies grow or if in the absence, you know, have companies, as Ray say, 52% of companies in Fortune 500 have disappeared since year 2000. So we were finally in a world in which AI is commercial grade, where mm -hmm. you can buy a piece of AI that delivers a good, the interesting thing is that there is two narratives on AI. There is the, there is the, um, uh, oh my God, the robots are going to take over, <laughs> kind of narrative of with like you know, and, and and AI has done a brilliant job of branding themselves with like deep learning, deep mind, <laughs> you know, a lot of like a lot of like you know you know cortex kind of kind of conversations, right? It has nothing to do with the cortex, but it's a separate story. Um, and then there is the, the the shit that actually works and it's useful and actually delivers ROI. Yeah. So you know, when, when you roll out an AI model, you usually have two things running in parallel. You, you have the thing that works and you have the thing that is you're hoping is better and yeah. it will deliver a lift, right? So, you know, without getting too much into it, like a lot of the AI models that we're using right now are, are, are relatively simple, meaning this is technology that was invented in academia, I don't know, 20 years ago, like support vector machines or you know, uh, you know, random walks or whatever. Like these are, these are try and true kind of work that delivers the goods. The, the key for AI is that you need to have access to closed loop data. Yep. And this is why a lot of the predictive sort of works is because unless you can draw a straight line between, um, between action and result, you can imply causation. And if you can't imply causation, the model just gets lost in the mire and becomes sort of like a, cl a glorified clustering model that any you know, relatively decent analyst can do for you. Yeah. So that is the key. And this is why we remain in the engagement layer because we have access to what happened, like what do you do? And all the metadata that comes with it. What was the persona? What was the language in it? What was the time? Like what was the channel, et cetera? And what was the reaction or lack thereof from your customer? And what's the tenor, emotion, and sentiment and intent of that reaction? So you can continually narrow down to like what are the five things you should be doing? So the players that have access to proprietary data or that is closed loop are the ones that are going to win. So any system of engagement, um, Slack, Zendesk, even segment, like they have full loops of visibility, will take the cake and they will outpace everybody else who's trying to infer by looking at only one side of the equation. Yeah. I agree. The digital feedback loops are important. Basically yeah, what we're is, building is, is if you're- if, if More you're than important, software, it's necessary. Yeah. If you're selling software 10 years from now, you've screwed up as a cloud company. You should be brokering next best action and insights. And, and that's really where the market is happening. Hey, a real quick question. I know we're ending, but look, for me, Seattle is now the center for enterprise stop software and enterprise startups, right? You guys are M12 backed, 239 million in funding. What I want to know is 
what's this what's the startup scene like for you given that you got psl you got madrona you got m12 you got curious divergent founders co-op ignition i mean there's a ton of really good venture funds all in the seattle area um i, I was in a conversation yesterday that the, the so the phenomena you're seeing and 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 then and then and then, and then there is still the rich people who live here who will fund you anyway. <laughs> so so and, uh, the, the interesting part is there's two phenomena happening. One is that Silicon Valley got out of their own way, and now they're you don't have to be built there to be successful. Um, that's phenomena number one, and, and that's becoming a thing. Like they don't asking you to relocate to Silicon Valley anymore; they will fly to you, which is great. So I have friends who started companies in North Carolina, Boston, Salt Lake, Vancouver. So it's becoming, it's becoming broader, right? Yeah, but Seattle's special. There's tons of enterprise software talent. The, yeah. Seattle Not special. in those other cities that you mentioned. Seattle, I, so it's true. Uh, but the, we're, we're early innings in the game. The, the, the reason why Seattle is, is becoming a breakout is because Amazon and Microsoft is a feeder organization for the rest of us. So every time I had a conversation with, uh, so we talk a lot about immigration and what's happening. Sure. And I tell them like, I, my job is to move H1Bs from Amazon and Microsoft to us. Like we have a team. Well, that you're, you're basically getting H1Bs from California actually. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. But, 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 so. they, they go to Amazon and Microsoft and those are our feeder organizations and you know, proudly so. And, they come seasoned, you know what I mean? You don't have to pre-season that pan. And they, they already come in like slipstream right into the org and they start delivering the goods. So, the, the, and, and they are pushing the boundary of anything, right? Like, what is my R&D? Microsoft. Microsoft have buildings full of R&D who are pushing the envelope on what's possible in, in, in AI. All you have to do is show up and just you know, tell people that the, your work is gonna show up into code and it's gonna show up in the p in two quarters. So all of a sudden you go from like a pure research to like I can actually move the needle. That story sells all day. When I tell a, a, a they, they like waiting four years. They like waiting four years. <laughs> yeah, they, they they may, but but after that, you know, life is you know you only live once, yeah. and, and that stuff gets boring. And I can I can offer them you know the feeling of air in your hair as the company's moving fast. That, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I wish I had this some. Awesome. I love it. Right. <laughs> your scalp. Your scalp. Hey, Manny. <laughs> Manny, this is awesome. We're so happy to have you here for those listening on Radio Coast to Coast on Disrupt TV. We're listening. We're talking to Manny Medina. He's a employee number three at AWS, a serial entrepreneur. He's the CEO at Outreach. You can follow him at Medinism, M-E-D-I-N-I-S-M -I -I -S on Twitter. Thank you for being on the show. We want to see you at the Ambient Experience Summit, February 26th to 28th. We'll talk more about that later. You were terrific. Awesome. You were terrific. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. We could have talked to you for the whole hour. That was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's nice to see CEOs that love what they do. Isn't that great, Ray? I mean, I just read it. It's awesome. Average CEO works 10 hours a day, average 10 hours a day, and 80% of them work seven days, including weekends. So I want to meet the one who meets, works 10, dude. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. That's I know. an average CEO. So. I'm not doing My dad used to say when he had his own company, he worked half days, seven to seven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, man. And who do we have here, Bala? Uh, this is our cleanup hitter spot where we bring first ballot Hall of Fame disrupt guests to close the show for us. Nicole France, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Constellation, focusing on digital marketing, sales effectiveness, which we've been talking about, and customer experience. So what an amazing uh, anchor, anchor guest. Nicole's research examines the interrelationship between sales, marketing, customer engagement, and how to make it work effectively. Uh, Nicole evaluates the tools as well as the principles and practices to generate best results. You can follow Nicole on Twitter on, on, at LN France, L N F R A N C T. Welcome back, Nicole, to Disrupt TV. Thanks, Val. It's good to be here. I, I got to say, this is a tough act to follow between Guy and Manny. I mean, I'm like you. I could have listened to both of those guys for at least several more hours. It was a great discussion. I was sitting here nodding. You couldn't see me because my camera was off. But yeah, there was what some was great the, stuff there. What, what resonated so with you? Passion. What resonated yeah. with, with the two? Oh, man, there, there is a lot. And, yeah. uh, and you guys have a pretty good sense of the stuff that's important to me. But I think, you know, both Guy and Manny really hit on some areas that for me are critically important to getting this whole broader customer experience thing right. And one of the big ones, and, and it, was, it was sort of threaded throughout both of those discussions, is really understanding what's happening on the customer side. That this is really all driven by the customer, the buyer, 
And if you aren't really very good at understanding and empathizing with that context and, and really trying to discern what the motivations are and why, and, you know, to Manny's point, this is, this is unique in every circumstance, which, which is why selling is hard, right? Um, that's the kind of stuff that for me is so important because we can really try to design for and anticipate those things. And I think that's what we all ought to be doing as businesses. And, and we need to use these technology tools to help us to do that better. But ultimately, if we aren't letting customers drive the process based on their needs and their priorities at that moment in time, we're missing a trick and, and we're not going to be successful over the long term. So there are ways to influence that for sure. And there are ways to improve the likelihood that, that the result we would like to have ideally that hopefully is mutually beneficial for us and our customers is going to happen. But, you know, we've got to recognize that it really is a two-way street. And I liked, uh, I like Manny's comment about discovery being a two-way process on both sides. You know, I think that's, I think that's totally accurate. And arguably that's very much what happens at the end of a relationship as well. You know, why are you going away from a provider? What's your reason for cancellation? So there's, there's a really interesting set of loops there. And, you know, I, I like this kind of uh, esoteric sort of discussion too, but I really like it when you can apply the esoteric thinking to the very practical stuff. And that's the other thing that both Guy and Manny, I think really got into that is what makes this stuff happen. I mean, it's addressing those very practical, sometimes quite honestly, pretty boring issues that are what really make a business work or not. So, you know, understanding that someone's canceling because they didn't, they didn't ever use the product, for example, right? I mean, that's a big deal still, despite, despite all the focus many companies have on customer success. Well, it's really interesting, right? I mean, we're going from the art of deflection to the science of deflection. We're going from the art of engagement to the science of engagement. Yep. And this whole digitization and, and moving to things that can get more repeatable is, is, is what's getting us to scale, which we didn't have before. I mean, they were all guesses. Yep. Like we think this process is going to work this way. So, but speaking well, now, about now, that, you can test it. You can you can yeah. track it and you can test it. And you can also, I mean, one of the other things that I thought was interesting is, uh, and Guy was talking about this as well. There's been so much emphasis on quantitative analysis of this stuff, mm -hmm. and yet so much of the real insight comes from those qualitative interactions. So when when a former customer or someone who's canceling is telling you exactly why they're canceling, that's something you should listen to. You know, especially when you're, you're getting it verbatim, right? And that's the kind of thing that you need to be able to collect and understand and really analyze because that has an influence not just perhaps for your onboarding process, but possibly for your product development as well, right? I mean, the kind of stuff that's really going to feed into what you do as an organization going forward and, and your longer term business health, not just, you know, can I sell and, and keep customers this quarter or this year or next year, mm -hmm. right? But it wasn't in my list of values and, and other wasn't an option. I don't know how to record that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I, you know, I've done enough research in my life and, and the, the quants always hate this. I always want the free text field and I want an unlimited number of characters. And uh, yeah, anyway, let's just say no, that's no, a very, philosophical very distinction. <laughs> no, no, very important. We do that in our surveys. So hey, so talk to us about the new shortlist. We've got a bunch of shortlists that you are covering. And, and for those who are out there, uh, Constellation's research methodology starts out with the astro chart. The astro chart plots yep. the impact on business, right? And really, you know, uh, the ad adoption rate that's going on and this really determines the areas that we cover. And so you've got a number of shortlists, actually quite a number of shortlists. Talk I've got them coming out my ears, right? <laughs> so, but it's okay, we get more help. Probably, get more help so. there, yeah, there will probably be some more to come too. I mean, uh, um, you know, Part of what's so interesting to me, and it links back to something you mentioned earlier today as well about, you know, and it's a conversation obviously we have internally all the time about the fact that so many of the companies that are starting up that are getting significant investment that are becoming very successful, you know, it's not the, it's not the old days of full suite applications or even functional areas. We're really getting to this feature set area. It makes our lives as analysts a lot more challenging, right? Because part of this is, what are the kinds of categories and companies that are really important and which are the ones that, you know, might be kind of flash in the pan. So um, just a word on that before I get back to the shortlist. Um, one of the things that I think is so interesting and that again came out of the conversation uh, today is that I think part of the reason why we're seeing this trend is because actually creating something that is simple and easy to use, which is the consistency in all of these these companies and these and these offerings that end up doing really well, they very clearly address 
a problem and they make it really simple for whoever's using it, right? And that's true whether it's a consumer focused product or a business focused product. And the nice thing is we're seeing it more and more in the business side, it's about time, right? Because business users expect their jobs and the tools that they use in their jobs to be as easy as the things that they use in their personal lives, right? So that simplicity is actually really, really critical. The challenge is that it's hard to get there, right? And there's a lot of complexity, particularly technical complexity. You know, Manny talked a little bit about, you know, just how you use machine learning and AI to get to something that's better than what you already know, right? Just hinting at how challenging that can be. You can't get to that unless you have the ability to really get to grips with all of the technical competencies that are required to manage that complexity in the background to make it really simple for the user. And you can't get that right unless you're really, really clear on what the hell it is you're trying to serve as a need, right? So for that reason, we have a ton of short lists and we probably will have more. Um, I mean, I've looked at everything from, you know, marketing analytics, uh, marketing automation, Salesforce automation uh, for B2B, B2C, you know, there's such a range of stuff here because there's a range of needs and requirements for, that companies have, you know, you may have sector trends, you may have trends by size of company, but there are always needs that are unique to individual businesses and the way they want to put together uh, the tools that they use to solve those challenges is almost by definition going to be unique. So we're looking at things like um, sales effectiveness apps, right? Uh, it's one that, that outreach is on. Um, we've got stuff looking at CPQ, for example, field service automation. I mean, I don't think I actually could recount off the top of my head all of my short lists. Um, but what's cool about these is that they're a really good starting point for looking at some of the kinds of providers you might want to consider if you're if you're con if you're thinking about these particular challenges and how you want to solve them. Sure, sure. You and uh, David Chow wrote uh, a report that was targeted at the healthcare industry in terms of redefining patient experience. But your thesis, I believe, is applicable to any industry and, of any, and any company size. And it was called Insight Driven Experience Design. And you said with digital transformation now a top priority for chief executives, patients yep. must be at the heart of any new strategy. And I can replace patient with consumer, customer, you know, any stakeholder. So what yeah. is this concept called Insight Driven Experience Design? Well, it's really picking up on what you guys were talking about earlier. It's this idea of digital feedback loops and not just digital feedback loops, but, but critically the kind of scale and in, the true analytical insights that you get from those digital feedback loops. And that's partly because you also wanna be able to then provide uh, an indication of what the appropriate action is. So I thought, again, Manny's point about moving to systems of action. I mean, we talk about this all the time, right? This is exactly what we're trying to get to. Um, you're, you're, what you're really endeavoring to do is to build that understanding, whether it's of customers or of patients or partners, uh, employees, the same principles apply, right? understand the context, understand the requirements, understand the signals that you're getting. And I, I really like the discussion around correlation versus causation, because ultimately what you're trying to get to is a much clearer understanding of what those causal links are and what the indicators are that you can identify that will tell you what that causal path is likely to be. So then you know what to do next, right? And then it's about, again, back to my, you know, simplifying complexity stuff, knowing when you need simple and when you need complex Oftentimes, the real issue is how do you simplify uh, a signal to an employee in a given context to say, this is what you ought to do next. You know, and it might be this or it might be that, but you've got two or three options as opposed to an infinite set of options of what right. the right thing to do is. Makes sense. Makes sense. Do you think, yeah. you, do you think we oh, can ahead, the gap between correlation and causation just through simple regression analysis of win-loss data, especially if you can map touch points during the journey and look at the ones that are canceling versus the ones that are increasing their average deal size propensity to buy and have become greater lifetime value uh, um, um, and, and, and greater customers. So essentially a histogram that shows these are the population that win, these are the population that lose, and then potentially be able to detect patterns along the journey to anticipate certain outcomes based on historical data. I mean, we have the system to do that today. So why yep. do you think there's a difficulty in terms of correlation causation if you have good quality win-loss data? 
I think, you know, part of the problem is the uni universe of what you're analyzing, right? Because you aren't analyzing uh, the stuff that never came your way in the first place, which, which might be actually a really important data source. So, you know, it's almost like, what is the control group? If you're really going to be very specific about it. The other issue is you're only still ever testing with the data correlation. You're not testing causation until you actually understand the why of something happened. Um, and that is fundamentally a qualitative evaluation. What's difficult about that, and having done a good bit of win-loss analysis in my time, um, I, I think we all know part of the difficulty there is that it's often challenging to discern the why. So yeah. customers are often very reluctant to tell you if you go in as the company that lost or even as the company that won in some cases, why did we win or why did we lose? You know, there, there's a lot to get past in order to get a really genuine answer to that. And sometimes there are actually multiple components of that answer. So you can't necessarily get it from talking to one person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think there, there is, in that sense, a really strong value in doing that kind of qualitative analysis, getting what you can. Uh, I think it's always going to be a case of um, getting good enough insights because you're never going to have a, a perfect view, mm -hmm. you know. Agree. Back channels are great on that too, by the way, because yeah. back channels often tell you way more accurately what's actually going on than what you will ever get face to face. That's right. No, absolutely. Got it. Hey, real quick, we got questions actually from uh, from our one of our guests. So Zachary, uh, who on the short list is doing a great job with retaining customers through the methods that are being discussed on today's show? So. Oh, that's else? that's a good question. I I think all of us should try to chip in on that one. Um, Testing your memory. And what's the right measure on that? I mean, gosh, that is hard to say. I think everybody is still experimenting with this stuff, to be honest. And, and Guy mentioned that as well. This is really about experimentation with what is really working effectively with getting good customer engagement and, and retaining them, you know, getting them well at the, at the beginning and, and keeping them and keeping them engaged throughout. Um, I, I think it's a, a pretty common thing. I would say most of the companies, um, certainly in the newer types of shortlists that we have, speaking for mine at least, are doing a pretty good job of this because a lot of them are actually creating some of these new categories or operating in fairly new areas. So, you know, sales, sales enablement or sales effectiveness stuff is a great case in point. This stuff is pretty new. If it didn't work, these companies wouldn't frankly be around long enough to make it into a shortlist. Absolutely. Well, what happened was, right, I mean, we, we had the maturation of the cloud industry. We have the acceptance and adoption of cloud metrics. And suddenly we have a whole new set of uh, B2B vendors that are servicing the cloud companies that weren't there before. Yep. Right. So I would say to Zachary that that's, that's one of the interesting things, Zach. I mean, it's kind of one of the weird things that, that have shifted is that these companies are now there to actually help SaaS companies and subscription-based businesses be successful. So, so yeah. Well, what's interesting, that's... what's interesting too, is we're seeing that being applied in a whole bunch of other industries as well, right? I mean, you know, that, that to me is the really interesting part because, uh, you know, it's very easy for us as a, a technology sector to be very insular and self-referential. Um, and inward looking, right? But uh, when you start seeing the stuff being applied in other industries that uh, are not necessarily facing exactly the same kinds of challenges as, as software companies, it starts to get really interesting. Nicole, wow. where, are you, where are you heading next? Uh, what conferences, what, 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 where do you recommend our, our viewers to go to learn more about you know, the dynamics of customer experience, sales, services, marketing, and how companies can uh, compete and win? Well, Vala, it's interesting that you as a Salesforce employee should ask me that because I'm actually headed to Oracle open world next week. Sure. Uh, that's where I'll be. And, you know, absolutely. These are all themes that I think all of the major players in the, in the industry are looking at. And um, it's interesting to think how, how much the discussion has evolved yeah. over the years. I mean, you know, yeah, back office ERP stuff still matters, but, all of the big suite vendors are very, very concerned with everything to do with customer service, customer experience, customer yeah. engagement, um, and really trying to refine all of the elements that are involved in making that work for an organization. Absolutely. Well, for those listening to iTunes, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and on radio, we're here with Nicole France, VP and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research. You can follow her on Twitter at L-N-F-R-A-N-C-E. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. It's great to be here, as always. You're terrific. We, you know, I don't know. The 20 minutes goes fast 
too fast, Ray. I have more questions. I want to talk to all our guests much more. So unfortunately, we only have an hour. So, but it, it's the fastest hour of my week for sure. <laughs> it is. It is. And we're coming up on episode 164 on September 27th. Can you believe that? That is amazing. Is. So we're not going to have a show next week, but we'll have a show on the 27th. Uh, but I'm going to go through the calendar of what's hot over the next two weeks. It's Oracle Open World next week, Success Connect, uh, as well as Open Core Summit. And for the week of the 23rd, it's Inforum Inter Systems Global Summit, SAP Tech Ed, Alibaba Cloud Analyst Day, Sage Analyst Day, and a whole bunch of other things going on. So if you're following, in our, following the uh, high tech, B2B, sales, enterprise, cloud, startup world, that's what's happening. So what's on your Bala? What's going on with our guests for episode? episode 164 on the 27th? So we're going to skip next week. We'll be back right after that. We have Manish Gold, CEO of Truthsphere. We have Christopher Lockheed, one of my favorite guests, uh, author and host of Legends and Losers podcast. And uh, Holger Mueller, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research. So two repeat guests that always bring their A game and uh, looking forward to uh having you with us in two weeks. So if it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV. Closing remarks, Ray. No, nah, man, it's been crazy. I can't believe we're in the fall season already. So <laughs> happy awesome. Friday, everybody. Thanks everyone for watching. See you in two weeks. Bye everyone. All right, bye-bye.